Well, if I go first, everyone will have left by then. So you be okay. <laughs> Don't worry about it, Jay. Okay. Yeah, we'll go over a little bit of that at the uh, the end of our time today, so that nobody is caught unawares. Um, does does anybody want the Office of the Keys and Lord's Supper handout from last week? I didn't get. It. Oh, okay. Here. Thank you, Jay. Yeah, Thank you. Extra. We we had one. Yeah, we had. Oh, I have. Okay. You have this one. Right? Yeah. Okay. okay. Sorry. Yeah, I'm just going to do a brief review of that. But um, so the plan is. Okay, I'll give you that. Hmm? Well, that's the new one. That's so they need one. that one. That's the oh, one for today. I need that one too. Yes, you do. Um, so the the plan is to have the the rest of the videos that have been recorded. I will have them posted early in the week this week, okay. so that the ones you missed, you can go and watch. Um, Nothing groundbreaking, probably the one that uh, I'm going to kind of cover it again briefly here at the beginning before we do the Lord's Prayer uh, is the Office of the Key stuff, because that's usually one that most people don't know about and they don't quite know exactly how that well, functions. Thank you for it. <laughs> what is that? Yeah. Um, so we'll cover that a, a little bit because I think actually Cheryl Cedar was the only one here last week. Oh. And so and she's not here today. So. Oh, really? Um, was the only one. I told her she was supposed to represent all of us. Yeah. How'd yeah, she, you ducked out. How did out. she do? Yeah, I did. She did a good job. <laughs> good. But uh, that'll be on. So all of those will be posted to our YouTube channel. Have you found the first two? So you know where yeah, they're at, the playlist. The so if you go to, if, if you go to YouTube and you just type in Ascension PGH, it's a blue cross is the picture of our profile. You click on that. Uh, it's, well, it's the same place if you watch the live stream. It's in the well, same I spot. I watched the live stream, but somehow I haven't found that. So when you go to, when you click on a, a YouTube channel page, the little, there are little tabs across the top. Oh, yeah. Home is the one you're on, the video and playlist. If you click on playlist, there's a new member class playlist. Right oh, now there's only two videos. Playlist. I did but, video. Yeah, do it in the, the playlist okay. and then it'll be in there. Because since we're always uploading the sermon and live stream, under videos, it always does like most are, are those, so they're hard to find if you do that way. Okay, well, let's start with a word of prayer. I already read it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, we uh, give you thanks and praise for bringing us together to worship you this morning, and we're especially thankful for the gifts that you have given us through your son, Jesus. Now we ask that you be with us as we uh, learn more about you and your word and uh, how we as your church live as your people. And glorify you and spread your word to all those we meet. And we ask that you bless our time together um, as we learn all those things. In your name we pray. Amen. Welcome. Um, you have the Lord's Prayer handout right there? Is that it? Yeah, that's it. Okay. All right. So before we hop onto that one, we're going to look at the Office of the Keys stuff. So if you have your handout from last time, um, then I can use, you can use that. I have extras here. Right. That's what I said I already read. You already read this one? Okay. Um, so I'm just going to do a brief summary. I'm not necessarily going to follow the outline, but if you want to dig into it a little bit um, on your own time, there's a lot of references there. So uh, does anybody know what the Office of the Keys is just off the bat? We touched on it a little bit. It's for the repentant sinner, and then it's not for the unrepentant sinner. Okay, well, it deals with both. And what primarily is it dealing with? What gift? The gift. Gave us for the forgiveness of our forgiveness, sins. right? So, Office of the Keys is primarily about the forgiveness of sins. Yeah, this one's oh, that's that's much, better. Better. much better. Well, I try to not use these other ones because they do not erase well yeah. at all. Oh. Um, they leave like a bunch of residue. So, Office of the Keys primarily deal, deals with the forgiveness of sin. So, uh, if you have a Bible, open it up to Matthew 16. And we're going to be looking at verses 18 and 19. So, Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 and 19. Somebody there wants to read those for us. Somebody has a Bible? I can. 18 and 19. Yep. And I say also unto thee. <coughs> 
that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. All right. So that's where the phrase office of the keys comes from, right? That we're given the keys to the kingdom of heaven, right? And who is being given the keys here? Okay. So first in verse 18, Matthew chapter 16, verse 18 is the original scriptural basis for the office of the Pope. Okay. Um, now we have a different interpretation of that than the Roman Catholics do, but I'll read that one more time here. <clears throat> and I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not fail against it. So um, the Roman Catholic interpretation is that the rock that the church is built on is Peter. And the office of the Pope is the office of apostolic succession through the line of Peter, which is why it has a special place, even among those that are called to serve in the church. Okay, um, Because grammatically speaking, rock can refer to Peter. Now, it can also refer to the confession that Peter made, which is in the verse before, because Jesus is saying, who do other people say that I am? And then he asks, but who do you say that I am? And then Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. So our understanding of the grammar there based on not only is it grammatically po like possible, but given the context of the way Christ establishes his church everywhere else, it doesn't make sense to us that he would make a sinful human apostle the rock of his church, or usually the rock reference to the, the foundation stone of the church is always Christ himself, right? And so our understanding is that what he's referring to there is the confession that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. That's the cornerstone of the church, okay? So it doesn't ascribe a special office to a particular person, okay? So if that's the case, who's getting the keys to the kingdom, right? Um, and so that is... Uh, what we're talking about with the office of the keys, right? When he says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven, we understand to be given to the church. Right? And then what is the office that is, is carried out on behalf of God's authority within the church is the office of the pastor. And that's, even though we have multiple called offices in our church, you can be a director of Christian education at DCE, you can be a deaconess, um, and those are often called called positions in churches. Really, the only divinely instituted called position that we understand in the LCMS is the office of the, the pastor. And in the scriptures, it's overseer or elder uh, is, is the term that's used. Um, and then the other called positions are seen as working under the divine authority of the call of the church that's carried out by the pastor. So, all that to say that the office of the keys is, an, is a special authority that God has given his church to enact and maintain the message of the forgiveness of sins. Okay. Does that make sense so far? Yeah. A little bit of confusion. Was, yeah. It was, do you know that there were any apostles who were not sinners? No, they were all sinners. Yeah, yeah. they're human. Right. Which is why our understanding is if it's grammatically possible from the original language that it's either peter just a guy who puts his foot in his mouth all the time or the confession of you are christ the son of the living god are the foundation for the church then we're like well it's got to be the confession you yeah, are the christ I, the son of the living god right? I agree. Um, and i think the other the other element that is really strongly supports that from the scriptures is always the image of the stone the cornerstone the foundation is always christ so it wouldn't make any sense where it's priced everywhere else except for here it's Peter. Um, now, uh, the way this looks practically in a church is that the church then actually has the ability and you as its members, right? So like, let's say uh, Jackie um, snubs Melissa, right? Jackie does, not, <laughs> Jackie does not have to then come to me to get me to pronounce forgiveness for Melissa or for her. She can go to Melissa and say, I'm really sorry that I did that to you. It wasn't intentional or I was angry or whatever it is. And then Melissa says, I forgive you. And she has the authority to say that because she's a member of the church. Okay. Um, now, formally, 
the keys of the kingdom are carried out through the office of the pastor. So if you come to me for private confession, which you can do, um, and actually I'm planning on probably making that something that I publicly offer people who wish it, uh, what you would what you would hear after you confess your sin is I would ask you, do you believe that my forgiveness is Christ's forgiveness? And the answer, if if you're presumably if you're there to confess your sins, the answer is yes. And then I pronounce the forgiveness like I do on Sunday. And then after that, I say, go in peace. Right. Um, and so the office of the keys, what people usually get hung up on is the ability that the church has to withhold forgiveness. And, and that's what we're going to talk about. But I do want to mention that it's primarily about being able to offer Christ's forgiveness to others. Right. That's its primary goal. And even, and we'll see even in the withholding part, that is still the primary goal is the forgiveness of sins. Okay. Um, so an example for the withholding part is let's say that I know, and it's publicly known that there's a, a young couple in our congregation who are not married yet are living together, which we would say is against the teaching of God and against his design for marriage or someone who's openly homosexual and active in that, or somebody who is married but living with somebody else while they're still married to the other person, all of these sorts of, these sorts of things. I mean, I guess the sort of humorous example given is like if a member of your church runs a brothel down the road, right? Like that's, I mean, I guess you can't say that's never going to happen, but that's highly <laughs> unlikely, but that, that's sort of an example of a very public sin that is going to affect the witness of the church as a whole, where you bring the office of the keys to bear. Right. So, for example, the example I gave with Jackie and Melissa, that wouldn't be something that would ever get itself to me saying you cannot have communion until you address this, unless it becomes really bad. Right. Unless like Jackie's asked for forgiveness and Melissa says, no, I'm not. I'm not going to forgive you. I'm, I just can't do it. It's like, well, OK, if you cannot forgive. Right. Then the spiritual danger is now no longer Jackie's who sinned against Melissa. But now Melissa is actually sinning against Jackie by withholding forgiveness from somebody who's repentant and wants to. Sorry, I'm just using you guys as examples. <laughs> uh, what have you done? But then, it, but then it becomes then it becomes a, a spiritual issue that, of concern for me. Um, and usually, those things don't just stay between two people, right? And that's and this. So this is actually to prevent the sort of things that develop that end up dividing congregations and causing all kinds of problems. Right? And, yeah. and can I just add, when. When I tell someone I'm sorry, um, and they say, um, oh, that's okay, that kind of bothers me. I'd rather they say, yeah. I forgive you. Well, it's actually an opportunity for you to maybe witness to them about the gospel. I, I actually do that sometimes, where I'll say, no, it's not okay, right? Because in a way, when somebody says it's okay, and sometimes they really do mean right, I forgive right. you, yeah. right. um, but it's still, I think, a good opportunity, because sometimes people are like, oh, it's not a big deal. Well, if it wasn't a big deal, I wouldn't have come to you and apologized. It wouldn't have bothered me. So right. Much. And so yeah. because forgiveness is not actually for you. It's for the person who came to you and said they were sorry. Right. So it doesn't matter how you felt about whatever they're apologizing for. Now, if it's something they shouldn't apologize for, like it's not wrong or anything like that, then you should tell them that. Right. Because um, it's not good to get in the habit of apologizing for things that are totally fine. But. If somebody's come to you and they're they're experiencing anguish over a regret of something they did that was wrong, your response should be forgiveness because that's primarily for them. It's not for you, um, because they're the one in spiritual danger. You're not in spiritual. Danger. Right. The only way you become in spiritual danger is the example I gave, where you say, "No, I'm not." Forgiven. Right. Or if you don't apologize. <clears throat> or if you don't apologize, right? Um, so when you do that. Uh, but this always helped me is the parable of the unforgiven servant. No matter what somebody did to you, and I mean no matter what, if you withhold forgiveness, that is you. Right? Because the, the teaching of that parable is you have an unbelievable debt. There's no way you can ever repay to God. And he's the one in charge of you and the person coming to you. And he forgave that freely. And so if you withhold forgiveness from a fellow believer, who is desiring to receive it from you and has confessed their sins, you are the petty servant who choked his fellow servant out for a hundred bucks when he got forgiven a debt of 15 million, right? That is who you are. So that, that really helps me really not even entertain the idea of being petty about something 
even in, and I, and I do mean like anything. So like, even if somebody really did something wrong to you, that in, in the spiritual realm of things between us and God, it's always in the category of you're the petty servant, right? Because we have, we have no right, any of us, to withhold forgiveness from somebody who's seeking it, right? Because then we might as well withhold it from ourselves. And things don't end up very well for that servant in that parable, by the way. No. Um, so, because uh, the master finds out and he's none too happy about that. Um, so, uh, so those are the kind of issues that usually come up around the office of the keys. So, if you, uh, if you, God forbid, end up in a in a public sin, and you refuse to repent of it, and that's the key part. Uh, it could be that something starts out as a small white lie, or it could be a really big thing, like you start running a brothel down the road, okay? Whatever it is, as long as you, over time, are unrepentant of it, then what will happen, is, and this is sometimes called, like, church discipline, um, although I'm not always a fan of the, context, the connotation of those words, but um, then I will come to you. I'm not going to, like, you know, drag you in front of the congregation and say this person's doing this therefore they're not getting communion flog him. yeah exactly <laughs> it's not going to be that but i will i will approach you and say um as long as you remain insisting that that this is correct and not a sin despite the admonition you've been given by me and others from the word of god you will not receive communion right um and i would express in that conversation that the reason that i'm doing that is not to withhold the gifts of god from but so that you repent and then actually can receive those as the gifts that are intended. So even the withholding, the goal is the forgiveness of sins. So it's a good way to check if you're actually doing this faithfully is as long as this remains your goal for the person in question, the forgiveness of their sins, you're in good shape. As soon as it leaves that space and becomes a way of exercising control or being vindictive or getting revenge, it's no longer the office of the keys. It's just your petty spiritual problem. Okay. Um, my dad was a pastor for 28 and a half years in the parish. And I think he had to use this official like two times. It's very rare. Which is a good thing. Um, but I would say for me, the most common thing I'm anticipating having to do that for are, are young people like that are not yet married living together. And I don't want to have those conversations, but that's what the Bible says. So any questions about that? That's kind of a summary. Oh, that's exactly the way the Catholic Church is. Yeah. I remember that much. But, but so the, the key difference from us to the Catholics, most of this would be the same. The key difference would be the return to the church. We would not put any sort of task in front of you that you must do in order to return. Right? It would, it would be... Like, whatever it is, if you stop doing it and you express contrition and confess the sins and you receive forgiveness, you're good to go. Um, because the key thing about this is not the particular sin, but is the state of unrepentance, right? So any sin can be a spiritual danger in the long run if it's continually in your heart as something that you, because what, what are you effectively saying when you're unrepentant about something? I'm not sorry. Well, you're saying I'm not sorry, but you're saying something even deeper about the thing you're doing. It wasn't wrong. That it's not wrong, right? In other words, you're saying, God, I know you said this is a sin, but I disagree, and I say it's not sin. Which effectively is you saying what? You know, I don't care what you say, God. But if you say, if you're saying you know more than God, what you're saying is, I'm, I'm God, God. Right? Yeah. right? You know, all these other ones we agree, God, but this one we don't agree on, and since we don't agree. We're going with what I think, right? Um, and I always kind of put that in sort of tongue-in-cheek fashion just because it is sort of, when you explain it that way, it's sort of ludicrous. And obviously, it's easily recognizable. It's like the most arrogant thing you can do. But um, it's hard to recognize that for building sometimes. Does that make, make sense? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. So please don't make me <laughs> do that. It's not a problem. Yeah. I don't want to do that. <laughs> I will if I have to, because I do, I love you and I care about you and I want you to receive the forgiveness of sin, but I really don't want to do it. Um, okay, now we'll start with session six for today on the Lord's Prayer. So uh, I would highly recommend 
going through each one of the petitions and the meaning, just even just saying them and having a little discussion amongst yourselves about them, um, because it is really helpful for prayer life. Okay. Uh, how many of you would say you're really satisfied with your current level of prayer life? All right, we got one. That's usually okay too. All right. So most people, myself included, are not. Right. And it's weird, but actually pastors are some of the people at times that have the worst devotional lives because we're in the Bible all the time. We're always doing God's work. Right. <laughs> and so it can be easy to forget that I'm doing all this stuff, but I'm not actually letting the word have its way with me. I'm not just reading it and, and talking to God. Um, <clears throat> so don't hear any of this as like someone who's figured it out, telling it to the lowly plebes who haven't figured it out. Okay. This is, a, this is a, a common struggle, and it's an ongoing one. Even people who are, like, you maybe have, maybe you've experienced this, like, for two or three weeks. You're reading your Bible every day, and you're praying, and it's feeling great. And then something happens, throws you off your habit, and then, like, two months go by, and you're like, what happened, right? That is always the way it is, right? I confess that has happened to me. <laughs> me too. Me too, right? And so the Lord's Prayer, I think, gives you a good grasp of... Uh, always sort of a simple way to re-engage that habit for Luther, the Lord's prayer was like, if you can't think of anything to pray, pray this, right? Because it covers all of the bases. And it really should be the source of our understanding of prayer because does anybody know the context in which we were given the Lord's prayer in the scriptures and who gave it to us? Well, Jesus was trying to teach how to pray to his disciples. Right. His disciples teaching said, moment. teach us how to pray. And instead of teaching them how to pray, he gives them his own prayer, which is a really key change in our relationship with God. Is there a single prayer in the Old Testament addressed to Heavenly Father, our Father? There isn't. Right? Because in the Old Testament, that's not the relationship we have with God. Only Jesus had that relationship with God in the Old Testament. And so it's a really big deal when he gives that prayer to his disciples, because what he's telling them is, through me, you have this new relationship with God, and you can call him your father, right? And so the what does this mean there at the top of the page for the introduction? With these words, God tenderly invites us to believe that he is our true father and that we are his true children. So that with all boldness and confidence, we may ask him as dear children ask their dear father. Right? So those first two words, our father, are a big deal. And so imagine the disciples hearing that Jesus tells them to pray to God by starting out with those two words. Right? Because in the Old Testament, you aren't allowed to really even say God's name out loud. It was always written. There was a great amount of reverence for his name in order to not take it in vain and not in all this stuff. And now Jesus is teaching his disciples and he says, pray in this way, our father who art in heaven. Right? Um, so that's a big deal. And it's emblematic of this change in our relationship with God now that Jesus has come into the picture. And it really, I think, beautifully reinforces what uh, we call um, the glorious exchange that what we receive in Jesus when he goes to the cross really is his relationship, his righteousness with the Father, so that when he looks at us, he sees Jesus, right? And Jesus took upon himself us on the cross, right? Um, so we already start off really great there, but it's also a good template for prayer, right? So we use the Lord's Prayer to sort of help us understand the different aspects of prayer. So if you were to categorize, um, let's say, let's do the, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. What are the, what those words, what would you say they are as far as like a prayer? Are they a prayer of thanksgiving? Are they a prayer of petition? Are they a prayer of praise? Praise. Praise, right? So you're, you're praising God. You're identifying who you're praying to and you're praising him, right? And then we get to the second petition. And what do we say in the second petition? Top of the next page. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. So is that a praise, petition, or thanksgiving? It's a petition, right? So now we're asking God that something would happen, right? So we're asking that his kingdom come. We're asking that his will 
be done on earth as it is in heaven, right? And then we get to the fourth and we'll continue with our petitions, right? Now it's not a petition for him to act like in the world, but now we're saying, particularly for us, give us our daily bread. And then we're asking for the forgiveness of sins. Right? Um, and to protect us, not lead us into temptation, deliverance from evil. And then it closes again with a praise. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory of God. But, but a lot of my prayers tend to just be that, a list of things I want. And I'm so often told I shouldn't act like he's just a vending machine. Okay, I got this list today of stuff I want from you. Mm -hmm. But that's the feel that I, you know, you just went through these petitions. It's right. like, he's just listening. I need the, all these things today. So you if know? you were, like, if you were actually doing that, you wouldn't call him God, and you wouldn't praise his his almighty divinity yeah right okay so when you talk to god and you start out by saying you know my heavenly father almighty god or, or king of kings lord of lords you know uh mighty counts or all whatever the the epithet is that you use yeah right here it's hallowed be thy name right um you're acknowledging the relationship that you have with him right so one it's an intimate relationship now because of jesus because i can address the god of the universe as my father um, which is super cool but i also understand still that even though he's my father he's also still the god of the whole universe right so for me it always i i always use this uh uh this image of a throne room in my prayers right for one it keeps me thinking that it's a special thing that i actually get to talk to god because not everybody gets let into the throne room right you gotta you gotta be invited into the throne room um and and also i think carries the proper amount of majesty so even if you're just in your bedroom at night by yourself kneeling next to your bed you're in the throne room of god when you're in prayer right um and if you keep as long as you keep that sort of um context in mind when you're asking for things one you're answering the you're fulfilling the command he's given you to do exactly that he wants you to ask him for things and two you're acknowledging that like his answer is totally up to him right if it was a vendor list, yeah. that would be more of like, I'm telling you what you can do for me in this, in the sense of like, I deserve you to do this for me. Mm -hmm. And I have the authority to sort of like command you to, <laughs> you, right? Um, and if you're in the throne room of the king of the universe, that's a laughable sort of tone to take mm -hmm. because you don't have any authority in that space except what he has given you, right? Yeah. Um, the other aspect that I like is if you're ever having trouble with your prayer life, read the Psalms that's what psalms are the prayers some of them are sung prayers some of them are spoken prayers um but they're prayers there's a really good book cph has out um i've got a copy of it at home it's just the psalms with luther because luther would read all the psalms like once a week um and there's a little discourse in each one so it's a, a psalm you read and then a little writing from luther which is quite nice um but the Psalms, the reason I like pointing people to the Psalms is there's quite a few prayers in the Psalms. So what are some, let's just name some of the ways that we pray. So we talked about petition, right? What are some others? Praise. Praise. I know it's called praying for other people. That would still be a petition. Oh, well, I guess it, I know what you said. Intercessory, intercessory prayer. Session. Yeah. Intercessory prayer. Thanksgiving. 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 What's the difference between Thanksgiving and praise? Maybe. Well, oh, the first one says you can do it. The second one is after it has happened. And you're saying thank you. Okay. Yeah. Right. So. Because uh, I think some, like sometimes there's a blurry in the lines there, but they are distinct things, right? So when you're saying, hallowed be thy name, you're not giving thanks for something you've received, or even you're not even necessarily giving thanks that his name is holy. You're just praising that his name is holy, right? Um, so Thanksgiving, an example would be like, you know, you know, relative went to the hospital and had a medical test and you prayed that the test results were negative and they came back negative, right? And then thanksgiving but you can like when you get when you get sort of deeper in your prayer life you can even offer thanksgiving when the prayer is not answered the way you wish 
by thanking them for like, well, even though so and so got a got a bad test result and things aren't looking good, they believe in Jesus, and so I thank you for the gift of faith you've given them. Um, all right, there's one more sort of major one of the songs. Is it, is it the category where the songs are basically just venting to God? Yes. I mean, you're telling him. Yeah. Okay. So the, the word that, that we would maybe recognize as venting, the sort of like biblical word is lamentation. So those are, are psalms of frustration and sorrow. So uh, if you've ever been at a point in your life where you're annoyed at prayer because you've been praying for something and it's not happening and you just feel like God isn't listening, weirdly enough, God wants you to share all those thoughts with him too. Really? Um, yeah. And the Psalms are a great example of that. That's one of the reasons Psalms are great because in our culture, in our Christian culture in the West, that's like about the last thing we think of as proper prayer. But it's emblematic of this new relationship you're in, right? God is not some distant judge that you must appease. He's now your father through Jesus. So earthly fathers in the room, when your kids are really going through it, do you want to know? Yeah. Or do you want them to not bring that to you for fear of letting you down? <laughs> you want to know? Yeah, you want to know. You want to like know how they feel that day. Yeah. Well, and it, you know, let's say uh, your son or daughter's spouse tragically passes away. You don't want them to bottle that up and pretend it didn't happen because they don't want to burden other people with their problems, right? That's like the opposite of what you want. And so God is the same with you, right? When you're really struggling, I mean, look at the book of Job, right? He's talking to God all the time and he's just like, what's happening here, right? And there's so many Psalms that start out with like, I'm in anguish and agony. Where are you? Why have you allowed my enemies to triumph over me? Where is your justice? All these sorts of things, right? Um, now, why is that not actually a questioning of God's authority and existence? Yeah, but there's a there's a key part here I think is really easy to overlook because I think that's usually the pushback against that. It's like, well, that's not very reverent. It's not very like you're not acknowledging that God's in control of everything. And like, who are you to question God and why he's not doing what he's doing? Right. That's usually the thought process why people don't pray that way it's selfish it can feel that way so but there's a reason that even when you do that it's not it's because you're still praying to god right and by praying to him like because sometimes when i read job i remember thinking like the, the whole bet was that job is going to like question you and curse your name and it sometimes it almost sounds like he does and so i was like it seems like god lost the bet what's going on here uh, and it was because Job was still praying, talking to God. He was still seeing God as the person who had the answer to the problems that he was dealing with, right? So he's still acknowledging that, like, here I am, Job, and here is God who has control over all things, right? So even though he's going to God and he's frustrated and he doesn't know what's happening and he's wondering, like, where are you and what are you doing or not doing that I think you should be, Right? He's still hoping that God is paying attention. Right. God is still the solution to whatever thing he's frustrated about. Right. Uh, and of course, you may not like the response you get from God. It may be sort of humbling. And that's what happens to Job. God says, I'm God. Right. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the world? Where were you when I did this, that, or the other? If you can change the mind of the heart of any man, come back and talk to me. Right. Uh, in other words, like, you know, I'm God, you're not God, and I know what I'm doing, right? Um, so that, that, and I think that is an important part of prayer because we all, each one of us has some point in our lives, or maybe you've already had one, where you're frustrated at prayer, you're frustrated at God, even though you believe in him. Doesn't mean you're not believing in him, but maybe there's just been a bunch of things that have happened to all of us. And you're just like, what is happening? How is this happening? Right? Um, and yes, you know, you believe that, there's life beyond death and that we're a citizen of the kingdom of heaven or whatever. Right. But that doesn't just seem to do it at that moment in time, because you're in the midst of so much 
something. Um, and so I actually did have somebody that was going through that a couple of weeks, maybe a month or so ago. And I gave them some of these psalms. And I said, even if you can't say the words yourself, just read them from the psalms. And know that, like, one, you're not alone in that place. Right? David, the man after God's own heart, was in that place many times. Right? And those are some of his prayers that are doing that. And the depth of the suffering you're experiencing, Christ has experienced on the cross. That he took you on himself. Right? Um, and sometimes it's hard to feel that. And so that can be helpful. Because venting, when it's properly done, is a healing thing. Because we're not meant to be alone. We're not meant to bottle all that stuff up inside spiritually either. So, um, so I recommend those. If that helps you use it, um, I would definitely recommend the Psalms. They can give you some ideas how to pray. Um, now, um, in the Lord's Prayer, you're covering all the basics. Right, so you're not getting into super specific things, but you're you're praising and honoring God. You're asking that His name be kept holy. You're asking that His will is done and that His kingdom comes, which is essentially like, I'm ready for you to return, and I want Your will to be done in the world and in my own life. Right, so that's an important part: the acknowledgement of His will that is done. So one of the, one of the other ways you can avoid a petition prayer turning into sort of a laundry list of things you want God to do for you is at the end of your prayer you say. Thy will be done. Or you can even say, and sometimes I do, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Right? Because then regardless of what you said or you asked for prior to that, you're acknowledging that like your will is the good, even if it's not something I want to hear. Right. And that's what we want to have. Um so that's and then you get to the the earthly sort of petitions for your own needs, give us this day our daily bread, that covers a ton, right? And in, in Luther's here, what's meant by daily bread, everything that has to do with the support and needs of the body, such as food, drink, clothing, shoes, house, home, land, animals, money, goods, devout husband and wife, devout children, devout workers, devout and faithful rulers, blah, 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 right? Big category. So that's what you're, that's what you're covering there. Uh, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, right? So going back to the office of the keys and forgiveness of sins, right? We're praying not only that our sins are forgiven, but that we forgive those who sin against us, right? Which is an interesting prayer because usually you're tempted to pray, I hope that person who wronged me will come and apologize. <laughs> and what you're praying for here is that when they do, that you forgive them, right? Once again, acknowledging that then the spiritual danger would be on you if you withhold that forgiveness. And sometimes it's hard to do that. And so this is a prayer to guard our hearts against that, that uh, inclination. Um, and then, and lead us not into temptation. Now, sometimes people ask, you know, follow up that with like, well, does God lead us into temptation sometimes? Well, Luther answers that there. And what does this mean? God tempts no one. We pray in this petition that God would guard and keep us so that the devil, the world, and our sinful nature may not deceive us or mislead us into false belief, despair, and other great shame and vice. I'm on page 36 of the handout. Sorry, I'm kind of hopping around a little bit. Um, I thought that was a given. Huh? Lead us on the temptation. Why would God ever lead us into temptation? Well, do you think that when you pray for, um, for basic provision, that that's not also a given from a loving God? Maybe, maybe not. Right? Well, so the, but the point of that is that, um, like, Again, a parent example is a good example, right? So uh, if you want your kids to come to, you want your kids to come to you and ask for things, even though they're things that you're going to give them anyways, right? Um, because there's a value in, the, in cultivating that aspect of the relationship and the posture of Thanksgiving and the posture of, of and so that this is similar here that like, of course, you know, God's going to do these things without us asking for them. He's not waiting for us to be like, well, I wasn't going to do that thing that I normally do until, until Kurt prayed about it. Right? That's not the way it works. Um, but he does want us to do that so that we're involved in that process with him. Um, to deliver us from evil, right? Similar thing that, uh, that he would protect us and rescue us. Um, and then the conclusion for thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever and ever. 
on that. Um, so in general prayer, does anybody know what amen means? Or, or why amen. we say that at the end of the, huh? Or amen. Or amen. Come Lord Jesus. Uh, Come. Close. Let it be. Yes. Yeah, like let it be so, right? Um, so um, when they're saying let your yes be yes, your no be no, right? Uh, amen is yes, yes, it shall be so. Right, and so you're essentially saying like, you know, thy will be done. Amen. Right. Let it be done, you know, as you dictate. And that, like, it's sort of like a finishing of your thought and acknowledging that you're placing it in the hands of the Lord. Make it so. Right. Essentially. Yep. Um, so are there any particular, or I guess the, the question a lot of times people ask is, can you pray incorrectly? Uh, and the answer to that is yes, you can. Now, the standards aren't super high here, so it's pretty easy to not pray incorrectly, but, um, or I say, it's easy to pray correctly, um, double negative there, uh, but so essentially the only way you can pray incorrectly is either by praying for, like, evil things to happen or by praying to the wrong thing or person. So if you're praying to trees and nature and, um, you know, a person you like or an ancient god of some culture that is an incorrect prayer i don't think simple. there was any wrong way to pray to god well there is if you ask him to be your agent of revenge on somebody of course there is. Yep. some people want to want to pray that stuff you're tempted to be like this person is evil and this wrong thing lord punish them for it that's not, yeah, yeah. It's not a proper there prayer. were those in the psalms but they're never specifically about a person Right. No, they're, they're an army. They're, Destroy it. They're about <laughs> punishing wicked and evil doing people. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, and um, and so there is that element as well, right? So that you do as a Christian, you desire the destruction of evil and wicked. Right? Um, now, hopefully, that doesn't involve the actual destruction of wicked and evil people, although sometimes it does. Mm -hmm. um, but um, so yeah, there's some pretty intense psalms along those lines, right? Um, but uh, like your neighbor Jeff, who uh, you know his tree fell in your yard and he didn't help pay the fence to re you know repair the fence or whatever, um, like it would not be a proper prayer for you to say, "Dear God, smite Jeff with a lightning bolt," <laughs> because he did not. You know. well, what about, for example, um, somebody's being convicted of a crime? Uh -huh. Can you say, "Let this person"? Who's guilty gets life in prison and is let off. And you pray for something. You pray that they get released? No, you pray that they get life in prison, for oh, example. Justice. Um, I hope they get punished. Justice. Yeah. Justice. You know. Yeah. So uh, our understanding of that would be that God has given the governing authorities and the laws of the land his his approval because they're there, right? They don't get anything on their own. Um, and so that would be a prayer in accordance with justice. So even if uh, like for any of you, if you committed a crime, I wouldn't pray that you're not convicted of it, one, because that's how the law works. It shows you your sin by levying a, a true accusation against you, uh, and then God brings about repentance through the consequence of that. Um, but that's also, a, like, God is also just, right? And so Christians, especially sort of newer denominations uh, and flavors of Christianity, really lean so heavily into the, the freedom and the love of the gospel side of things that they forget to acknowledge sort of the reality of the world we live in. So in Lutheranism, we call this uh, the two kingdoms, the kingdom of the left and the right. That has nothing to do with politics. The left is, is the kingdom of um, the world, and the, the right is the kingdom of God. Or vice versa, I can't remember. Um, but in the kingdom of the left, like we don't have any right to like pray that justice is not done according to the laws of, of the governing authorities, right? So our prayer is that through the justice that is being done, that this person comes to a knowledge of the truth and repentance and, and faith. And not that they're, you know, you could get to the point where like maybe it's somebody you personally know and you visit them in prison and they've, you know, they have turned their life around and, and their faith is really important. So they've been there for 20 years, and, you know, you, it would be an okay prayer for you to pray that they get leniency or, you know, better treatment or something along those lines. Um, so, 
I love that. Let me answer your question. So for us, like when we're praying, there's the dynamic of what do we want to happen in the kingdom of heaven and what do we want to happen now? Um, and people get confused about that sometimes, especially when it comes to examples like that. Like, is it a wrong thing that somebody who did something wrong is convicted and put in jail? No. no. Maybe unpleasant if it's somebody that you love, right? But you're not praying that like justice is not done and that they get off free because you know. I was I was just saying because we were talking about but that, you know, I think that happens all the time. You see someone in the news and did some, some terrible crime. And, oh, okay. And you're praying like Yeah. That's an okay prayer. Yeah. Yeah. I mean you, you you know, it would be it would be appropriate until it gets into the realm of like essentially the, the object of your prayer, the the goal should always be like their end good, right? Even if like what you're praying for is something that the world would say is like suffering and bad, like, Lord, I pray that this man who, who did this thing is, is found out to have done it and is put in jail. That's an okay prayer. Um, I would typically shy away from making those super personal just myself and probably say something like, Lord, in this situation where this, this horrible thing has happened, I pray that justice be done, that the truth may be found, and that those involved who, who, who need punishment receive punishment, uh, and, and through that punishment, repent of what they've done, and those sorts of things. Because um, you start to get into tricky territory when you wish their ultimate ill, right? So not that you, you, you know, wishing them to be in prison for a crime they've committed is not that, but if then through that, you're sort of doing it as a means of revenge, or because you despise them and you want them to die, right? That's a different thing. Does that make sense? Good question. Um, really powerful example I read about, uh, well, maybe you saw this video too. There was the, the video of the, I can't remember what state it was in, maybe Tennessee, where the, the female cop came home to her apartment and it was actually the wrong apartment. She thought it was hers. Oh. And there was a the guy who lived there, and she thought he was an intruder, and she shot and killed him. And uh, there was a video from her trial, um, because as she should have been, she should have been punished for that, even though it was a tragic thing. Um, the younger brother of the victim, like, forgave her in court, right? And that was just a really, you know, if you can find the video, it's a powerful video to watch. And it's a good example of that dynamic, that even though, like, his brother is, he's basically, he's not wishing that she's let free, but he doesn't want this to be like something that crushes her eternal soul. Um, and, uh, and he's not looking for the penalty to be something that sort of is like this revenge that like you ruined our life because you accidentally killed our brother. We want to ruin your life kind of thing. Um, and it's super powerful witness to God. I mean, Amish people are really known for that as well, that they'll visit people in prison who've murdered their relatives and witness to them. And it's like, that's an unbelievable witness to the grace of God. Uh, very difficult. Like, unbelievable. Well, there's, I know lots of people who've told me I'd never do that. Uh, but that's what we're called to in forgiveness. And that's what you're praying in the Lord's Prayer when you're asking that not only uh, are the sins um, that are your sins forgiven, but that you forgive others the sins they commit against you. Because sometimes that's not a pleasant experience or something you want to do. Um, <clears throat> so back to right and wrong ways to pray, we'll kind of conclude with this. Um, so the the proper ways to pray, it's, it's not very difficult. It's a few basic ingredients, like uh, you're praying to God. So, you know, Heavenly Father, Almighty Father, um, you can pray or uh, you can't, but sometimes we do Jesus and you can pray to the Holy Spirit as well, although that's not as standard, but it's like you're essentially at the beginning of prayer, you're acknowledging God and who you're praying to, right? Um, the sort of formulaic liturgical prayer style is that the next thing you do is you'll, you'll reference an activity or work that God has already done, right? So you'll say, just as you have that just as you uh, once freed your people from slavery in Egypt 
And then you would say like, you free me from my, the slavery of my slavery to the sin. So you probably all heard a prayer in church sort of like that. Um, so, uh, and that's sort of a praise section. Now that's not required, but I think it's a good practice because um, one of the key jobs that we have, especially in terms of like our children and our witness to the culture uh, is beautifully expressed in the Psalms. It says that we are to tell of the mighty and wondrous works that God has done. And this helps you kind of recall those because you're, you're saying them a lot, um, but that's not, I would like, this is sort of a recommended thing. This is required. Um, an appropriate request or, you know, Thanksgiving. Uh, and by appropriate, I'll say morally good by biblical standards. Right. So desiring justice or that wickedness be punished is is a moral good by biblical standards of uh, desiring the destruction of someone's soul is not right those sorts of things um or just sort of like petty little revenges like if if if, if it's a wrong thing you ought not to pray for it even if you really hope that it happens to somebody you don't like right? um, that's not correct uh and then um the acknowledgement of sort of thy will be done in some form or fashion. And that doesn't necessarily have to be verbal. So what's a nonverbal way that you can exhibit that you're at the mercy of God and that his will is what's going to be done? Okay, so the posture of your heart, yes. right? You can make the sign of the cross, right? Well, what's the image when somebody's praying that you typically have in your head? What are they doing? Holding your hands, closing your eyes, closing your eyes, head. bowing your head, bowing head, right? Uh, some of the, even kneel, right? Um, most churches used to have kneelers in them like 60 years ago, so that during confession and prayers, people would kneel. Right? All of those are signs. Ever have kneelers? Huh? Really? Yeah, yeah. Actually, the church that I previously served, I they still have one. Catholic they still have them there. I don't, like about half the people do that. Um, all of those are reverence postures that exhibit this reality, right? That you're submitting yourself to God. And so even though I'm asking for things or I'm, I'm praying to you and, and desiring a certain outcome, I'm acknowledging in the midst of that prayer that it isn't what I want that should be done, but what you want to be done. Because <clears throat> the recognition is that maybe the good that I think I want is actually not a good. Maybe it's just a you good for me, call, right? Well, for example, let's say you've been praying your whole life for a relative of yours to come to Christ and you haven't, and they get diagnosed with stage four cancer and they have four months to live, right? One prayer you might pray is that they would be delivered from that diagnosis and that, you know, a miracle of healing happens. And God may say, no, because I'm concerned with this person's soul and they've been running away from me their whole life and I want them to face the things they're not facing. And so he may know in his wisdom and his sovereignty that by allowing this to happen to them is the way in which the Holy Spirit will work in their heart and bring faith. And then God gets to spend eternity with them. And the good that you wanted was maybe five more years. On earth, right. So um, this acknowledgement of like, you know, what is right. I don't, I'm asking for what I think is good, but if that's not the good, your will be done. Right? Um, and that's why, there isn't sort of an arrogant posture to the, the way that you, you speak or you hold yourself when you pray because you're acknowledging this wrong. Um, I like to do it verbally more as a reminder to myself than anything. Um, and I usually call it out by saying, but Lord, not my will, almost as a reminder to myself as I'm praying, not my will, but your will be done, especially if it's something that I really want to happen. Um, and then the, and the amen i the i think the easiest way to remember the amen the amen is sort of like like it's in your hands right I'm, I'm, i've given it over to you which i think is a helpful imagery because you're usually a lot of times you're praying about things that make you anxious right? and most of the things you're praying about that make you anxious you have zero control over and what you're doing when you say, oh, man, after you pray about these things is you're putting them in the hands of the person 
who actually can do something about those things, who knows the best solution that you may not know, and you're essentially saying, I've given this to you, let it be done as you as you think. Okay. Um, the other the other distinction I like to teach about prayer is um, there are spiritual gifts in the Bible, and there are spiritual practices. <coughs> what do you think prayer is? It's a spiritual practice. It's a spiritual practice. Now, the reason that I highlight that is some people use the spiritual gifts, even if they're thinking unconsciously, <laughs> as a reason why they don't pray that much or they won't pray with other people. Well, Kurt, I mean, he's just got a way with words when he prays. He's just got the spiritual gift of prayer. So we'll let, we'll let Kurt do that. Um, and like that's often what happens whenever I go places, people want me to pray because the pastor, well, you're a pastor. Pastors pray. Pastors are good at prayer. Right? <laughs> um, and, and then usually, especially when I'm teaching confirmation, I make confirmation kids do the prayers because I teach them that the reason that the pastor is good at praying is because the pastor's prayed a lot. He's practiced a lot, right? He's practiced a lot. Yeah. And so, like, uh, if you serve on one of the ministry boards here, one of the things we do is we do intercessory prayer for each other at our meetings. And so you'll pray out loud in front of other people. It's a horrifying, grueling experience of having somebody else pray for your, for your concerns. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, I mean, it can feel that way, though. I mean, there are a lot of adult Christians who have never been asked to pray in front of another person their entire lives. And these are people that go to church every week. Or maybe the only person they've ever prayed in front of is their spouse. And it's like... The devil wants to convince you that, like, that's not a place for you, that, that you should keep those things yourselves, that you, shouldn't, that you shouldn't engage in that level of relationship with your brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, but the Bible says no. Yeah. Some people are so good at praying. Yeah. You know, you're in a group and you just think, man, that was, that was a really good prayer. And mine is, you know, three sentences. Sure. I mean, like... There is like wordsmithing skill, I suppose, that's involved. But most of the people who are good at that, it's because they're comfortable doing it because they've done it a lot, right? The first time I preached a sermon, I don't even remember it. <laughs> Were you like, right? yeah? Well, oh, it's a brand new thing. I've never done it before. Uh, you know, I I can turn a phrase. I know I know words and you know all that good stuff. But like, that's a new thing. So that like, I don't even want to go back and look at. It. What I wrote for that because it's probably horrible, you right? Have to be comfortable uh, with yourself, and it helps you from being get, getting embarrassed, right? And the way that happens is through practice. Oh yeah. Now the ideal place that that happens is in the home. Okay. Um, so God has sort of set it up to where, like, the first person you pray with on a regular basis is the person you're married to or your children, um, and. You're usually doing that. You have an extra excuse of like teaching or spiritual health, right? Um, and it's a small audience, so good place to start. And by the time you're going to be praying on some board at, at a church, you've done it thousands of times at home with your kids. And now, just because somebody uses big words and they have a nice turn of phrase doesn't mean their prayer is any better. Than yours, right? So when you're talking about somebody who's good at praying, that's all you need to be good at praying. It doesn't mean that like, you're able, like, that's why I say this one's optional, right? Because this one sort of requires you to have some, like, biblical knowledge that you can just sort of bring to your mind to be like, just as you, um, you know, uh, showed your might with Gideon's army, show your might, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, we always right? remember. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, so, like, those sound nice, and there's a place for those, but sometimes the best prayer is, dear God, Help me, please, on that. And that can be a, a more powerful prayer and a more stunning prayer in the right context than a really wordy one that has all this nice church language. And you can go, you can get out of hand with that too, where people are like, "Dear God, let this prayer end." Um, okay, so, um, so that, so the the niceness of the language or the turn of phrase doesn't always mean that it's a better prayer. Right? Um, but the goal is. Being comfortable in conversation with God, not only in the private in privacy, there is a there's a place for that, right? Jesus goes off to pray on his own, and there's you know, pray in secret, and your father in heaven will reward you. There is that, right? 
So like in this context, we're doing something like intercessory prayer for each other and, and people aren't going to reveal the deepest, darkest things in their heart. That's not the place for it. Right? Now, in a group such as this, if somebody did, they would be met with compassion and support, but that's really not what it's intended for. Right? Now, if somebody comes to me one-on-one -on -one in private confession, they're going to share some of that stuff, right? Um, but those, like that sort of, because somebody asked me about that. I don't know if this is in this class. I talked to so many people about the stuff. I don't remember who I said to. Um, that the scriptures do talk about praying in secret. So why, you know, what's wrong with that? There's just nothing wrong with it. But part of the blessing of the body of Christ is the sharing of one another's burdens. And one of the ways you share each other's burdens is praying for each other. Um, and I learned this, this is the last thought. I learned this really strongly from a, a college student on my vicarage. Because um, I, just by observing him, one of the things that he would do, I got in the habit of saying, somebody said like, you know, could you pray about this? And I'd be like, yeah, I'll, I'll include that in my prayers. Um, and I still do. I still say that, but a lot of times what I'll try to do, if it's appropriate, um, I'll say, well, why don't we pray about that now? And I'll hold their hand or we'll just, we'll just hold our hands and I'll say a quick prayer about it. And I learned that from, from this student who was like five years younger than me. And that was what he would do because he was like, I have to do that, otherwise I forget. I always felt bad when I'd say I'd pray for somebody that I never did. And I was like, that's, uh, that's good. So that's something I do, but that's a great blessing. I mean, somebody here at the church, you know, you, you know, you just open up and say, I'm really struggling with this thing. And I could use some prayers. They say, well, why don't we pray right now? And some of, the, some of the work that I do that you'll interact with me, if you go into the hospital and you're having a surgery, if they'll let me come to the hospital, I'll sit with you before the surgery and we'll say a prayer. If they don't let me come, which they haven't recently, um, I will call you on the phone and we'll say a prayer on the phone. Because um, that's part of the blessing of the body of Christ and raising me at the church. So any questions about Lord's Prayer, prayer in general? All right. What about uh, Office of the Keys and all that stuff? All right. Last chance to ask any sort of burning question about faith about anything if you've got before you're before you're gonna swear your life away in front of um before you're gonna make your confession yeah uh we, i was gone for a couple of weeks too could i do have a, a copy of it that they yeah so what i think i'm gonna do is i think i have everybody's email i'm gonna attach i have this all in the document i need to take some stuff out of it because i i borrowed some of the stuff from somebody else and yeah. so there's some specific information there about their congregation that doesn't apply here but i'll i will attach that to an email i send all of you when i send because i'm going to send you an email once those videos are uploaded on youtube so that you can so you can watch those and i will send an email with an attachment on it so i'll set a reminder for myself to do that right now okay. so I don't forget. does that work sure all right thank you oh no problem send an email sort of like that prayer thing if i don't do this one yeah. i'll only remember that i should have remembered something but i can't yeah. remember what something is well, that's something by itself which is which is almost worse You're yeah well like, why yeah. couldn't i just forget entirely that i'm not in anguish about the thing i forgot that i can't remember lord let me forget right <laughs> he grants that one to me yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> all right well let's close with the word prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all of the mighty and wondrous deeds you have done in our lives and in the lives of so many, especially a good reminder on this All Saints Sunday that the joyous gift of the church and through the church, the means of grace of your son, Jesus, so that we know why we are here, the purpose that you have given for us and our certain and future hope in Jesus, that we are going to be with you forever in your kingdom. Um, perfect harmony and righteousness and peace. In the meantime, Lord, we are in the world accomplishing the tasks that you have placed before us as your church, sharing this wondrous message with others, being together as the body of Christ, um, uplifting one another's burdens, sharing one another's burdens so that we can run the race of faith and bear witness to others. I thank you for the people who are gathered here. I thank you that you have brought them to our church 
And I pray, Lord, that their time here is a blessing to them and to this congregation. I'm confident that you have brought them here and that that will be the case, um, that through the gift of your word and sacraments and the blessing of the fellowship of the saints, that we will enhance one another's lives of faith and continually point one another to you. All these things we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. All right, just a nuts and bolts thing.